Hello, can people hear me? Yay, awesome. So thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, I am Juliana Yi, for those of you who don't know me, I use she, her pronouns, and I have the distinct honor of serving as an assistant dean for Yale College and director of the Asian American Cultural Center. Woohoo! <laughs> <clears throat> Established in 1981, the AACC is 42 years old this year and is the third oldest cultural center of its kind on a college campus. If you didn't know that, now you know. Um, and on behalf of the AACC, it's my sincere pleasure to welcome each of you to this evening's event, which is part of a larger series for Yale's 2023 Pan-Asian American Heritage Month featuring our guests um, honor of honor, Dr. Jenny Sume Wang. Uh, before we proceed with the rest of this evening's program, I want to first acknowledge the Quinnipiac Nation upon whose land we are settled and Yale has built this university upon for students and our campus community to learn, work, and grow. We want to acknowledge the ancestral homelands and traditional territories of indigenous peoples who have been here since time immemorial and to recognize that we must continue to build our solidarity and kinship with Native peoples across the Americas and the globe. So Yale University and the Asian American Cultural Center located in New Haven, Connecticut, acknowledges that indigenous peoples and nations, including the Mohegan, Mashantaka Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scatacoke, Golden Hill Pagasset, Niantic and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquin speaking peoples have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We also acknowledge that this country would not exist if it was not for the free enslaved labor of black people. And so we honor the legacy of the African diaspora and black life, joy and knowledge. I want to thank AACC Associate Director Shiraz Iqbal, who's back there. <clears throat> Our students, Sunera Suba, who you will see on stage later, Alicia Mazura, Bel Zufri, Ava Estacio Tuhi, Leka Sunder, Yelk Mental Health and Counseling Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Andrea DePetris, and the Good Life Center's Woodbridge Fellow, Jackie Zhang, for their support in making this evening's event a success. You might have seen them ushering you in or doing something behind the scenes. So it w I personally would not be able to pull things off without all of them um, supporting in the, in the front and the back. Um, and the AACC is also really grateful to our co-sponsors at Yale, including the Good Life Center, Yale Mental Health and Counseling, the Chaplain's Office, Yale School of the Environment's Office of Student Affairs, Yale School of Management's Office of Inclusion and Diversity, and the Asian Network at Yale for their support. Before I introduce our featured guests, I want to talk quickly a little bit about how this event ties into our 2023 Pan-Asian American Heritage Month theme of celebrating Asian pride, power, and possibilities. Given the viral and racial nature of the COVID-19 pan COVID pandemic that we have lived through, as a community, we have in particular witnessed, either been witness to or experienced ourselves heightened levels of anti-Asian racism both in the US and on a global level. And so when I thought about this theme, I felt that it would absolutely be necessary for us to have an event that was centered on mental health because of how critical it is after having experienced so many different kinds of losses that we would not be able to reimagine new possibilities for our community without properly attending to what mental health means for our community. And so that's what led um, to this event. And specifically, I've also been following Dr. Jenny Wang's work from afar for a while. And a lot of, I don't know if you follow her on Instagram. Um, if you don't, you should. Um, a lot of her content has definitely gave me a lot of food for thought um, and just you know, a time to pause during so much that has been happening to us. Um, in, in sort of the last couple years. And oftentimes it feels like we need to move forward without fully processing, right? Because of the pace of Yale or just like life um, demands. So I hope that today's event will give us all some good food for thought that we can then sort of bring 
into our various communities and circles to continue the conversation because it certainly doesn't end here. Um, and so that's my hope uh, for all of us tonight. Um, and so without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jenny Wang, who is a Taiwanese-American clinical psychologist, speaker, and author on the intersections of Asian-American identity, mental health, and racial trauma. She received her doctorate from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and completed her postdoctoral training at the Duke University Medical Center. Her professional mission is to destigmatize mental health within the Asian community and empower Asian Americans to prioritize their mental well-being. In her private practice, she has witnessed how difficult it was for Asian American clients to find mental health professionals who understand their unique immigrant and diasporic experiences. This led her to start mental health directories, including the Asians for Mental Health Therapist Directory, to connect individuals with culturally reverent mental health care. She created the Instagram community Asians for Mental Health, follow <laughs> Asians for Mental Health right now, uh, where she explores the unique ways in which Asian American identity impacts our mental health. Her first book, uh, Permission to Come Home, Reclaiming Mental Health as Asian Americans was published by Grand Central Balance in May 2022. And there will be six lucky winners who will get walk away with a copy of Dr. Wang's book, but you'll have to stay till the end to find out if you are one of those six. <laughs> so without further ado, please help me in welcoming Dr. Wang to the stage. Right. I feel like this has been in the works for so long. And so to like take a moment and behold all of you in this room with me. I was telling, you know, Juliana earlier and a bunch of students that like this is one of the most invigorating settings for me to speak in because you guys have so much energy, so much hope and so much opportunity. And so thank you for having me today. Thank you for being here. Um, so, you know, I think about this idea of mental health for Asian Americans. And when I started my Instagram account, it was simply to build a directory. Like I was simply just DMing therapists being like, hey, will you fill out this Google form? I'm building this directory. And as I was sharing kind of content, creating posts, I realized that there was a lot of mental health content out there, but there wasn't anything that centered the experiences of Asian Americans. And I caveat that in saying that we are not a monolith. There are so many diverse experiences. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Let's see if I can drop this in my pocket. Um, and so, really, you know. That account made me realize that there was a niche, there was a need. And truth be told, when we submitted my book proposal, the first publisher said, there's not a market for Asian American mental health books. And I kind of sat there like jaw open. I can't believe you just said that to my face. <laughs> because there was a sense that there are a lot of Asian Americans who are coming into this realization that perhaps mental health was something that we really need to, to focus on. And so this question of why would we write a book, right, centering the experiences of Asian Americans within mental health came up again and again. And so I think back to like this why, and I think about how our stories are so intimate, so unique, right? And so this is a picture of my grandfather and um, the day I immigrated from Taiwan. So I was two years old, about to get on a plane. And this was that sliding doors moment where everything changed in my life. And I'm getting emotional because that sliding doors moment became a capstone for so much of my experience as an immigrant here in the United States. And so when I think about the importance of our story in terms of our mental health, I think about it in the context of these three areas. Your history, your people, 
where they came from, what they endured, what they overcame to be here. I think about your specific wounds, the parts of you that still hurt, the parts of you that you may not speak about, the parts of you that still are not recognized. And then I think about your strengths, right? The parts of you that evolved to overcome some of these wounds, to overcome some of these contexts that you exist in. And when I think about it, this is mental health. These three components, when I think about my clients in my private practice, these are the stories, these are the things that we're excavating. But often we don't take the time, we don't have the space to go into these areas. And so when I think about excavating history, there are way more than these components. These are just a couple that come to mind, right? You think about your culture, perhaps your faith or spirituality, your migration experience or that of your ancestors. You think about your childhood experiences, the intimate family dynamics that earlier today, I was talking to a bunch of students, they're still at play in your life. We think about your educational journey, which is where you are here today, how this is shaping you, how it is showing you that you belong or you don't. And then you think about these non-family relationships, the chosen family, the people who are there for you and understand you and see you in a way that perhaps you've never been seen before. And then the systems that you tolerated. Now I pause here because in a lot of my life, I didn't realize there were systems. I didn't realize that as an Asian American, there was something called racism at play. And I felt it, but I had no name for it. I had no words. And so when you think about the systems that impacted you and shaped you, I hope you really give yourself a chance to name them as well. And then we think about this idea of naming wounds, right? And a lot of people will say, well, why? Why do you want to go there? It's so painful. It just gets you all riled up and then you feel chaotic and upset for days. Why do we even bother? And I think the thing that comes to mind for me is this idea that these wounds, if untended to, fester. They sit beneath the surface, they sit within your psyche, and they build. There's shame often surrounding it, there's embarrassment, there's fear, and it grows in silence. And I think about you know, how in many Asian cultures, we approach mental health with that very erasure of the pain. We say, just keep going, be productive, do something with your life. That somehow will solve those wounds. And now, you know, working with people, I guess, 20 years ahead of you in their 40s, their 50s, they realize none of those achievements none of those things that they accomplished really made a dent in any of these wounds. And so in many ways, and I use this analogy having trained in medical centers, we have to kind of excise the wound. We have to open it up a little bit in safety so that we can give it fresh air. We can give it new context, new stories, new narratives, and realize actually that it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault that I was treated the way I was because of the way that I looked. It wasn't my fault that I struggled in these dynamics because I never got a chance to learn how to communicate. It's not my fault that I avoid conflict because that was really scary to me as a child, right? And so I think we do these things because in many ways it gives us a chance to breathe and it gives us a chance to put our identity in a different context. Now, I want to point out this errors of omission. So I think that a lot of these things are things that are affecting you. They're inflicted upon you at times. But I think there's also a certain pain that comes from the things that could have happened that didn't, the relationships that you wish had occurred, 
that didn't. I think about how a lot of the clients I work with, they're still navigating how to be honest, real with even their own parents, and how for some of them, their parents could not offer the things that they wish they would have had as children. And that's a wound in itself, right? The things that we wish would have been, but never did. And so I love this quote by um, Resma Menachem. He's a, he calls himself a um, somatic abolitionist. He is a psychotherapist by training, an author, a speaker. And he says, trauma decontextualized in a person looks like personality. Trauma decontextualized in a family looks like family traits. And trauma decontextualized in a people looks like culture. I remember like hearing this quote for the first time and just being like, oh my goodness, right? All of these facets of individual or collective experience that I thought was like innate. That's just who I am. That's my personality. That's why I act this way. Might have been fashioned out of me. Might have been pressured by the forces around me. Might have been shaped by society. And so this leads me to kind of wanting to share a little bit about our trauma responses, right? And oftentimes we've heard of the top three, the fight, flight, or freeze response. And across kind of human condition and time, when we're under a place of threat, when we're fearful, these are natural responses that happen, that get activated in us. And then there are the two lesser kind of known or now more, more kind of in public discussion is the fawning feigning response. And these are more so related to more complex PTSD kind of ideas. But this idea that we might actually comply with our attacker, that we might actually minimize and shrink ourselves in response to threat. And this made me think about the model minority myth. Right, so I think by now most of us have heard of it. We understand that there's this kind of stereotype associated with certain Asians who look a certain way, because not all Asians may experience this stereotype. And we think about the certain characteristics or stereotypes associated with this myth, right? Docile compliant, passive, hardworking, all of these narratives that I think have been very much embedded in kind of American society when you think of perhaps an Asian American. And then I think, huh, how does that map onto some of these trauma responses? Does anybody have a guess on what might be some of the reflections of these in this stereotype? Fufita shout it out. Make a guess. Any hypotheses? I don't, I won't bite. <laughs> what do y'all think? Bonding and feigning. Yeah, so interesting, right? The don't rock the boat, stay under the radar, work really hard, but don't work too hard so that other people might be jealous of you or perhaps try to tear you down. Those were some of the narratives I remember my parents telling me, and my mom's here. <laughs> she can attest to that, right? And so I think about how those pressures in some ways might have been internalized through generations of Asian immigrants, right? We think about early Asian Americans that came here or Asian immigrants that came here and faced intense discrimination. Perhaps one way in which they coped was to respond in some of these ways, right? And it's not to say that was the predominant response because we know through activism and a lot of the Asian American activists that there was a fight response too, right? But you think about how then that starts to shape how a culture might actually internalize the forces around them and cope in response. And then this coupled with some of these cultural concepts of saving face, 
right? This idea that I represent not just myself, but my parents and how they raised me, my community and how they shaped me. And not now the stakes are much higher. It's not just me that I'm representing, it's everybody else. And so in many ways we try to protect, we develop a persona. We say, this is who I am and everything is great. Everything is perfect. And I think that poses yet another layer of making mental health even more difficult in our community. And then we think about shame, right? I think there's been a lot written about shame in a lot of cultures. And I think in Asian culture, right, there's phrases that we say in Mandarin and different languages that denote a, we don't bring shame upon our family. You don't do these things because this would bring shame. And I think mental health as a stigma, right, is rooted in that very shame. It is the avoidance of that shame that we might bring about to our families and our communities that then we say, no, I'm fine. Everything's fine. I'm okay. And so then if we have forces against us, then we either crumble in the face of them, which sometimes happens, or we start to develop coping strategies, right? And so when I think about my clinical practice, a couple of them come to mind, especially within the Asian American clients that I work with. So I think of perfectionism, I think of people pleasing, I think of hiding, invisibility, dismissing oneself, right? I think of hypervigilance, always scanning for threat, always triple checking myself so that I don't make mistakes, and a lot of fear around failure and then a lot of code switching, right? This being able to move in and out of spaces. And my client likes to say, I'm like a chameleon. I'm really good at reading what you want and giving that to you. But if I'm asked what I want, I have no idea. And so I'm not saying that these, these coping strategies are good or bad. There's actually no morality around it, right? It is what evolved and develops when you're under certain pressures. And at the same time, I think when these are our primary and only coping strategies, I think that becomes problematic, right? And so I think what is the cost of operating, for example, out of a perfectionism kind of framework in all areas of my life? Believe me, I've tried. It's exhausting, right? And you kind of develop this ability to say, huh, this is how I have to show up. Because if I don't, then what will people think? How will they judge me? And so um, I think that one of the things that we have to consider is that perhaps these coping strategies could exist on a spectrum where you can dial it up and you can dial it down you put it in the context of doing it intentionally. Because let's be honest, there are spaces, for example, when I'm in a meeting with the former director of NIH, and he's you know, this older white male, and I, I sit up a little bit straighter because I feel like I need to, because I feel like that is the only way that I'm gonna be taken seriously as an Asian American female. And I code switch, and I do it because that is the reality. And then there are days where I actually say, you know what, I'm not gonna do that today. I'm gonna actually just try to show up as who I am. And so perhaps these coping strategies can exist on a continuum. And if I'm aware of it, I can dial it up and I can also dial it back. I don't have to perform or act out of these strategies all the time and bear the cost of using them all the time. And so I always like to say to my clients, when we have these coping strategies and we don't have awareness around them, they're just reactions. I'm like playing out a role. I'm like a puppet. I'm a marionette, right? It's a knee-jerk reaction. And I can think of one that I had even when I was younger, where, I, where somebody higher up in hierarchy, be that age, gender, 
right, race, um, social status. Somebody higher up in hierarchy, I would suddenly mold into a deferential relationship with them. And I think as I got older, I started to realize, why do I do that? Why, why is that my response? Why don't I ever see myself as their equal? Why don't I ever show up that way as my instinctual response? But it wasn't until I started to question and bring that pattern into awareness that then I had power around it. Then I re realized that I could act intentionally, that I could choose when I wanted to show up like that, which I do with my parents. I defer to them out of love, out of respect, but I may not do that now to people in these higher levels of social hierarchy because I realize I don't necessarily need to, right? And so that awareness, if we develop it, now turns into a strength because now that coping strategy is something that is a tool that I use. And I actually get to be deliberate with how I use it. And I can be choosy about when and where and with whom I use it. And so then, right, if coping now with awareness is a strength, then perhaps strength with a whole lot of practice becomes your superpower. And I say that because I feel like I've witnessed that for myself, you know, that in a lot of situations in the past, I cowered, I hid, I stayed under the radar as the good working Asian person. And then I realized that wasn't getting me the relationships, the situations and the opportunities that I actually wanted. Because somehow I would get passed up. Somehow people wouldn't think of me when things and opportunities arose because I wasn't believing that I could be visible enough to other people. And so then I started to practice. I said, okay, I'm gonna read the room. I'm gonna see what I needed to do and what it cost me. And then I started to say, you know what? I'm gonna show up a little bit more. I'm gonna speak up a little bit more. I'm gonna take up more physical space and things started to change. And how people related to me changed. And then I realized that the very parts of myself that I hid my entire life, those were my superpowers. Because I'm speaking to a room of y'all, right? And so perhaps we could practice and we could start to expand what was possible for ourselves. And in that, we start to change identity. We start to change what's possible for us. And so I always get the question like, so then if awareness is the key, how do I develop awareness, right? And I think one of the first things I think about is, well, what are your models that you're operating out of, right? What are the rules, implicit or explicit, that you live by? For a long time, my rule was, as an Asian American female, you're passive, you're compliant, you follow the rules. Why? Why should I? What were the forces that put me in that situation, right, and led me to do that? And so if you think about questioning the models, right, then I would argue that you have to question everything all the hierarchies that your intersectional identities pull at, all the parts of yourself that you assume are rigid and unchanging, all the facets of your personality that you thought were innate, perhaps they're changeable too. And so, you know, I think one of the things that I, I try to kind of encourage people to think about is, could we live our lives with a little bit more nuance? And I work with my clients a lot on this cognitive skill because as human beings, we're wired to sort and categorize situations and experiences. 
And so it makes sense that one of the cognitive distortions in cognitive behavioral therapy is that kind of binary thinking. So I work really hard with my clients to try to create the spectrum of thinking that might exist, right? So oftentimes I know a client is growing and changing when they can say, the old me would have done this, but the new me is actually doing this now. And what we work really hard to do is actually to create the spectrum that exists between the old me and the new me. And then we start at the beginning and we say, what is one thing, one step, one tangible action that you can take that moves you further along that spectrum and begin to change and shift right? who you are, how you show up and how you see yourself. And, um, and so that, that then brings me to this idea of metacognition. And I feel like in the neuroscience world, it's like a big deal, right? Lots of research being done. And it's been associated with a lot of benefits in learning, emotional regulation. So metacognition is simply this idea that you have the ability to think about your thinking, right? Like you can sit here in the room right now and be like, I'm trying to focus on her, but right now I'm thinking about what I'm going to eat for dinner. And that's an example of metacognition, right? The ability to think about your experience, to reflect upon it, and to then make adjustments. And so this is such a powerful mental health skill because what it does is it, one, helps you see some of the granularity in life instead of a knee-jerk reaction. And I always say to my clients, when we're trying to build their kind of skills or practice towards new behaviors and changes, metacognition gives the ability to take a slice or a situation of your life, slow it down, and almost see it as those old movie-like reels where you can see frame by frame by frame of a situation. And then think about where in each of those frames could I change something, react differently, do something different? And I think about this a lot when I am thinking about even just my relationship with my parents. I remember being a teenager and angsty and lots of conflict, right? And I think about how now I'm able to see the conflict, if we have conflict, as it happens. And I'm able to be like, oh, hold on. I recognize this movie reel. This is how it used to be. And I can say, oh, at this point, this is where I used to then start yelling or get angry or reactive. But I actually don't have to do that today. In fact, what would be different if I actually said, you know, dad, I understand what you mean. I know this is hard for you. And what's powerful is that then you invite other people to change how they engage you, right? And so this is why this idea is so important, is that you have power, you have agency in these dynamics and in these relationships. But you have to develop the muscle of being able to see your life in this slower frame, or we're just reacting or exploding, right? Um, and so I, this is like a funny little caricature, but I think about how if metacognition is so good for us, then what is like the opposite of metacognition, right? And I think it's avoidance, it's suppression, it's the disconnect from the active conscious thinking part of our brain, right? It's the this person says this and I shoot back with this and then I undercut with that and then they react and we play out the same dance that we've done in our entire lives. But instead, right, perhaps if we actually connect with some of that emotional discomfort, we connect with some of that frustration or in some cases the anger which often is highly stigmatized in certain communities, families, cultures, right? Perhaps that anger is trying to tell you something. 
perhaps is trying to give you data points to work with to know what to do next. And so I always say avoidance from a mental health perspective as a short-term strategy makes sense, right? Like if you're at work and something happens where you know somebody says something that's kind of offensive and you're just like, okay, I'm gonna block that out. I'm gonna temporarily not go there because if I do, I might say something I don't wanna say. That's effective, that's short-term avoidance. But let's say it keeps happening again and again and again. That avoidance as a long-term strategy is no longer effective because those data points are saying to you, somebody's crossed a line and we've allowed it to happen again and again and again. And so short-term avoidance is okay, it's how the brain copes, but in the long term, if we don't somehow move away from avoidance into recognition, into naming, into processing, then we notice we find ourselves in the same patterns again and again. And I say all this and then I come to this very end where I say this to my clients all the time. We can develop awareness, we can build metacognition, build up your self-soothing, all of those amazing skills. But if you don't act and change how you engage your world, very little changes, right? And um, James Clear, who wrote the book Atomic Habits, um, he makes this really neat distinction that I read about and it was really helpful. There's a difference between motion and action. So motion is this movement where we're planning, we're organizing, we're getting more data, we're learning, all this stuff. So things are moving, but we're not going anywhere until you actually take an identifiable action towards something, right? And the problem with a lot of us is we get stuck in motion. I know there's some conversation that I need to have, but I gotta like, think about it. I have to write out all my points before I say it. And then I need to write the script and then I got to edit my script and then, oh, and then it's been three months. We're stuck in motion, right? And very little action. And so I encourage you to think about, are there areas in your life where you've been delaying action? Because it's scary. It takes courage, it takes support and community to take action. Are there areas where you can act? Maybe it's finally calling a therapist. Maybe it's finally calling home, talking to a parent. Maybe it's changing your major because you're very unhappy, right? What is it gonna take to take action? And then I wanted to kind of think about like, you know, oftentimes people are like, well, what can we do to protect mental health? And so I was thinking about, you know, cause I, I work less with college students now. And so I work a lot with people who are like the 15, 20 years ahead of you. They're often working, they're parents, they're caring for elderly, they're, you know, and I was thinking, what could we glean from this group to help this younger group, maybe not make the same mistakes that we did, right? And so I think about like, the first thing that comes to mind is, do you know yourself? And right now, I don't expect you to know yourself, right? You haven't had enough feedback from the world and data points yet, but do you even make space to get to know yourself, to listen to yourself, to notice? your experience. And also, what values are you living your life out of in this stage of your life? Because it's gonna change, right? But what are the things that are your priorities at this moment in time? And then I think about the importance of learning how to set boundaries. Who, who's got a good handle on boundaries? <laughs> yeah, I love it, right? Boundaries, 
It is the ability to protect and preserve the very resources that you have. And I always say boundaries are how we teach other people how to love us well. When I tell you that you've crossed a line, I do it out of love and respect out of this relationship because I still want that relationship. I don't set boundaries with people who I don't want a relationship with. It's not my, worth my time, right? And so those boundaries allow you to exist and I to exist fully as ourselves. And so learning to set those boundaries now will pay dividends, I promise, for you going forward. Um, the next thing that comes to mind is communicating our inner life. For so many of us, we've been isolated. Pandemic was a perfect example, but I think you know, we think about like right now, we have an epidemic of loneliness. People feel perhaps surrounded by people, but never seen. They feel intensely alone. And what does it look like to be able to sit inside yourself, understand how you feel and to be able to share that and to be seen in that? That's magic. Think about the last time you truly felt seen by another human being, where they saw you and they honored you and they valued you. And they didn't try to fix your problems or they didn't try to like tell you to go take a nap, eat a dinner, right? They just sat with you and held you. That's powerful. Um, and then I think about this idea of stress management. And we all have stress. Stress is good for you up until a certain point. And I think about how, you know, in some ways, stress is like a seesaw, right? You have stressors and you have coping. When they're balanced, you feel probably okay. But when your stressors outweigh your coping, you get overwhelmed. And then when it goes the other way, you're like thriving, right? The demands don't seem that overwhelming. So can you think about your life along that seesaw? You have times where it's imbalanced. And so your options are to reduce your stressors, delegate, set boundaries, say no, or you boost your coping. And if you learn your coping resources now, when you get out into the working world, when you now have families or you're taking on a lot more, you will have that toolbox ready. But I have a lot of 40 year olds, 50 year olds, who they've never developed those things before. They don't have anything to reach into. So when stressors come along, they are extremely overwhelmed. They feel so lost. And so how do you develop those coping strategies now? And then I think the final thought is that silence breeds shame. And shame brings us into a cycle that is extremely harmful for identity. And so if there's one way that we could destigmatize mental health in the Asian community together, it is just breaking the silence. And I always say this, when we show up vulnerably, when I say to a friend, I'm really struggling, and I feel like I don't know what I'm doing right now, right? I feel like life is out of control. I'm actually giving this person the gift of going second. I'm going first. I'm being vulnerable first. And it gives them the opportunity to also be vulnerable back. So when we share, it's also a gift, not just for us to receive care, but it is a gift to others as well. Um, so I think I will end there. And final note that I'm a firm believer that mental health preservation, well-being is an act of social justice. And I say this because if we have not tended to our own wounds, 
how do we expect to behold and be with the wounds of other people, other communities, and people who are also struggling? And so when you tend to your mental health and you move towards healing, it has a ripple effect into how you then can do the same and also create a home for others. So I'll end there. Thank you. Beautiful. Can we get another big round of applause, please? Thank you so much for just the warmth that you brought into this space. I definitely felt it, um, even though I was, you know, distance from the stage. I definitely um, felt the care that you put into your words, and I really appreciate that. Um, and thank you just for being in this space with us. I love what you said about demanding and reclaiming space and I hope we can all do that here together today. Um, so yeah, I'm going to ask a couple of questions and then around maybe 6.15 um, I'll open it up for the audience to think of things so keep those minds going. Okay, <laughs> um, as my first question, how can we redefine what self-care looks like especially considering the larger systemic factors that determine mental health that you mentioned? Um, why is it critical to also address trauma from larger systems of oppression within healthcare? And kind of broadening this question, how can we redefine self-care as community care, both within and outside the clinic? Okay, so I'm gonna go through and try to answer each of the components. Um, I think self-care it's gotten really like popularized, right? It's like this pop psychology concept now. And I think that oftentimes self-care is hard, right? It's doing the things that you know you should do that are difficult actually, right? And I think that in many ways, self-care is about resource management in a way, right? It's your time your energy, your presence, what you invest yourself into. And so self-care either helps build that up and protect it, or the actions you take drain from it. And we expect that there are gonna be things that are important in your life that you wanna drain, right, a little bit from so that you can mobilize and do the things you need to do. But then I always say, when does the line end where you say, now I recoup myself, I replenish, right? And so I think from an individual perspective, that self-care often is maybe some of the like exercise, the movement, the you know therapy, being with people connected, that's all part of it. But it's also the things that you are actively guarding against that might drain you, right? Relationships that are not life-giving, people who don't seem to understand your boundaries, overcommitting, I do that all the time, right? Overcommitting even though I know that it makes me grumpy, right? <laughs> and so these are those things that are hard to do because often they're great opportunities, right? They're things that you wanna do, you believe in, it's impactful. And at the same time, you know it may not be good for you to say yes. Um, and then I think about the community care piece, and I know this is hopping to your third question, but you know, like I think self-care is something where when I am in a place of abundance, I can offer that to other people, right? I, you know, when I'm feeling good and thriving, I am able to orient away from myself and actually say, what is going on for other people that they might have a need, right? And there's an overflow of oneself that then enters into that communal space. But if I'm feeling diminished and overwhelmed and overrun, there's no overflow left, right? There's barely overflow to like my kids and my family, right? And so I think 
all of those things are interconnected, you know? And I think that communal piece is so powerful because it mobilizes in really powerful ways, you know? And I think being at the AARC today, like that felt like an overflow, felt like an abundance, right? All of these students listed as leaders and, you know, participating in the resourcing for your community, that feels like excitement. It feels like something that they're a part of, right? And so I think in some ways the self-care is regenerative in the opposite direction. Community reminds us that we are part of something bigger and that that energy is something I can tap into as well. No, that was beautifully said. Um, community reminds us that we are part of something bigger. Um, yeah, I'm gonna get that tattooed on my forehead. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you so much. And just I think thinking about community and relationships, um, how can we bring up mental health to, for example, our parents? Um, how can we overcome language barriers, stigma, generational divides, um, to kind of translate this concept of healing? Yeah, I think we touched on this a little bit in our lunch meeting, you know, and I think something that I've realized is, you know, these ideas of kind of um, mental health often are very language based in the United States. It's like, let's talk through everything and let's process everything. And sometimes because of all the barriers you mentioned, that isn't the avenue that's effective, right? Like. I can try to sit there and talk to my dad about mental health, but it's gonna be like talking to a wall. That just is not a language that he's comfortable in and wanting to go into. And so sometimes I think we have to think outside of those spheres, right? Those traditional mental health contexts. And I think about how like, you know, oftentimes we'll joke about how our parents never apologize, but they'll bring you a bowl of cut fruit, right? Like that is how they connect, they offer a bid to us. And so sometimes our bids to our parents have to take on forms that make sense to them. So I was saying earlier that sometimes it's just being with them, like, you know, picking vegetables together. Like, you know, I remember doing that as a kid with my mom, like, you know, picking off the stems of things or, you know, standing next to each other and cooking. Um, I remember as a kid, my dad would work on the car and I would just sit out there with him. He would be laying under the car and I'd just be sitting there talking to him. Sometimes it is how our bodies are with another person and that's healing, right? And you think about how your body reacts differently to a professor versus your sibling, to your best friend. And that is also how we co-regulate with each other. And so sometimes I think maybe with some of our elders, it is a somatic healing that maybe is the entry point with them. And then over time, it is a, hey, I noticed you're not eating like you used to, or you seem really tired lately. What's going on? Are you okay? It's that noticing of them. And it's kind of what I said earlier about what does it look like to give somebody your presence? And I think sometimes our parents are like, oh, they're so busy. We don't want to bother them. We don't want to burden them, right? They're already in school, stressed out. I don't want to add more to their life. But then if we can turn the table around and say, but I see you, I notice I'm back for spring break and this is different. Tell me about that, right? And so it's a lower stakes way to build some of that foundation for opening up some of those conversations. And I said earlier, often it can feel like a lifelong endeavor, right? I, I will never get to a point where I'm like, checkbox, I've fully connected with my parents. I'll be doing that my whole life. And I think could we leave open the possibility that they will surprise you one day? They'll come to you and say, you know, I've been feeling really sad. I've been feeling really anxious and I wanna talk about it. And that will happen if you've built that foundation with them. 
over time. You definitely reminded me of um, picking the stems off of peppers with my mom while she's like hunched over and cutting other things. My dad is so impatient and refuses to actually teach me how to cook, but he'll let me stir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think just that act of being next to each other, I really resonated with that. Um, kind of returning to what you were talking about, um, about the body and how we react to our professors, right? Um, obviously, most of the people in this room are students. Um, so on that, what advice do you have to Asian students who feel like they are struggling to survive and not even really able to think about thriving? Um, what can colleges do to strengthen social and mental health support for Asian diasporic students? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think back to when I was in college and I'm like, Y'all work way harder than we do. <laughs> I think because there is a now, right, with social media, there's a cognizance of what everybody else is doing. And so you always feel like I'm not doing enough, perhaps, or I'm not achieving the thing, getting the internship, getting the postdoc. And so I think the frame and the reference point is so different for your generation. Um, and I just want to name that because that feels very difficult. Um, and so I think there's something about, you know, yes, you're here for a purpose. And that purpose is to gain a degree, really hone your ability to think and reason and apply that to real world problems that you will be solving one day. But I think as professors, as mentors, as graduate students, how do we also allow ourselves to be keen and open to when students are struggling and when there is a need for assistance, right? And sometimes we're just connecting points where we say, hey, I've noticed this. Have you considered visiting the counseling center or have you considered the Asian American Resource Center, right? Like, Sometimes it just takes someone to bring that to light for you, and then you're like, oh, yeah, there is something wrong, right? There is something that feels amiss. Um, and I think, you know, and earlier today we had people who were training to be nurses and physicians and PAs, and I'm like, those are the first line of mental health, right? If they get to me, they've already been through often several people before that. And it's not even medical professionals, it's colleagues, it's mentors, it's professors, right? And so maybe if as a society, we could all orient to that sensitivity to mental health need, then we could all play a part, right? In helping lead people towards the resources that they need. Um. So after this question, I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, but just to come for full circle and remind everyone, your book is titled Permission to Come Home, Reclaiming Mental Health as Asian Americans. So how would you define home? What is home to you? Mm, great question. I think home, and it's interesting, earlier we were talking, people were saying like home is Queens, right? And home is Chicago. Home is Philippines, right? And I think that as Asian Americans, if you have bi or multiracial background, like home is kind of an elusive place, right? It's a homeland, an idea, a group of people, a feeling even. And so I think I define home as, and I talk about this in the book, as a place where I find all four of these components right safety belonging authenticity and compassion and I think that when I think about the relationships that feel like what home might feel like it has all three I feel safe I feel like I belong I can be authentic and people see me with a compassionate gaze um, and so it makes me wonder, right, how people wear, there might be spaces. Like some people might say the AARC is a space of home for them here at Yale, right? And I love how there's a kitchen and there's a rice cooker and there's spices that, you know, are hard to find. 
that can feel like home, right? Because you're seen there. Um, and so I think now home is a collection of memories, of feelings, of people, of places. And I think whenever I feel lost, I remind myself that those are my road, those are the paths back home. Shout out to um, Shiraz also for going to the ends of the earth to get us saffron. We, we deeply, <laughs> deeply appreciate it. Um, no, I think that was beautifully, beautifully put. I think home is, in fact, in people. Um, and thank you so much for sharing that definition. Um, so we're going to open it up now for our beautiful, wonderful audience to share any questions they may have. Um, just feel free to raise your hand and, or come up to the mic, actually. <laughs> Oh, we have movement. Hi, um, my name's Sonia. Very Ooh. cool to hear you talk. Um, I guess this is not a fully formed thought, so I apologize if it's a little. Um, but you talked a little bit about how like the first step to making any progress is awareness, um, or just like breaking that silence. And I definitely agree with that. But I also feel like, especially among conversations I have with my peers, a lot of us are very aware in like a academic or intellectual way of like these are the steps that we need to take. And like, the, these are the things, almost kind of reminding me of what you talked about with like motion versus action. Mm. And I guess I wonder, how do you like get out of that lens of maybe like medicalizing or intellectualizing that awareness and actually like, for lack of better, like more descriptive terms, like processing and like moving through those feelings. Cause I think it, it even becomes difficult as like a community or like friends to talk through how you're feeling with things when your first instinct is like, yeah, I guess, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yes, yes, thank you for your question. Um, that is such a great point because um, intellectualization is a defense mechanism, right? So if you've taken Psych 101, you've learned about defense mechanisms and a lot of my clients do it, right? And we'll spend a whole session talking through the intellectualization and they have not felt a single thing because that keeps you here, right? And so I think that one of the things I'm curious about is could we actually pause as that person's talking and say, okay, hold on for a moment, but what are you feeling in your body as you're talking to me right now? Is your heart racing? Are your palms sweaty? Right. Do you feel like you have kind of like a headache coming on? Because that's knowledge too, right? And I think about a lot of like, you know, the, our cultures, we have movement as part of a healing experience for us because the body also carries that pressure and the stress. And so can we encourage each other to maybe tune into that bodily knowledge, right? Could we encourage each other to, for the moments that we can, put the intellectualization aside, right? And understand what's going on underneath the surface, right? And earlier, and I always say, I'm surprised I didn't cry today, um, right now, but I was crying earlier because it was so emotional. And we were saying how even crying together is healing, right? And so what does it look like to be able to allow ourselves to access some of the lower level, not lower level, they're not secondary, but more primitive parts of ourselves. Because right now, you're right, everything's cognitive. Right? And you're at a university where everything probably is very cognitive. And so what does that look like? And then also, like, how, how do we incorporate movement into our communal gatherings? right, drum circles, dance, right, yoga. Maybe that's part of some experiences that we can introduce with our communities. Thank you for your question. Hi, Dr. Wade, thank you so much for this. This has been really fascinating. Uh, I love the, the image of the seesaw that you were talking about in terms mm -hmm. of coping and then, you know, that sometimes you can get overwhelmed and, you know, 
folks are going through midterms and yeah. gasping, trying to get to spring break, so they're feeling a little overwhelmed. Um, Earlier in, in your remarks, you talked about code switching and um, as a coping strategy, mm. but it, it kind of, you kind of juxtapose it that it was inauthentic. And so I'm, I, I'm just kind of curious about that in terms of is code switching, is it inauthentic or is it presenting different sides of yourself in those situations? Yeah, that is such a great question. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes you get so good at code switching, you don't even know what's real, right? Like you almost feel like that's a facet of your identity that has been internalized. And I think that there are times where the code switching, like maybe over practice feels like a facet of identity, right? Like when I speak to certain audiences, there are certain references that I don't use certain vernacular, certain language that I choose not to use, right? And then when I'm with audiences that feel more resonant, I might break it out, right? I might use those examples. And does that feel inauthentic, inauthentic to me? I don't think so. I think that's kind of responding to the context that I'm in. But I do feel like there are times where certain behaviors or actions do feel inauthentic, right? Where the maybe like minimizing myself, maybe making a joke to make other people comfortable and making me seem kind of lesser than, and that feels like a code switch that maybe might have been required in an earlier, earlier stage of my life, but felt inauthentic and also damaging, right? And so I think maybe one of the ways we could think about it is like, does this code switching action damage how I view myself? Because if it does, then maybe it costs too much, you know? And, and if it doesn't, then why am I doing it? Is it actually necessary, right? And I have a colleague, she's a psychologist, um, and she is in New York City, and her name's Dana Crawford. She um, is an amazing, you should follow her on Instagram as well, but she talked about how for a whole year, she told herself she was not gonna code switch. And what she learned from that experience. And I think that one of the things that she shared was she realized how much of that code switching was self-imposed. Like you felt like you needed to, but the moment you didn't, it didn't, it wasn't received in a negative way. Like people were just like, oh, okay, right? And so I think sometimes maybe we can test the limits of that code switching. We may actually say, I'm not gonna do that so much today and see how that sits and see how that feels. Because if we're honest with ourselves, I am not certain that 100% of spaces that we're in are ready for us to not code switch. And I hate that I have to say that. Like it, it ugh, makes me mad that I have to say that, but that's the reality. And we code switch to protect ourselves. Otherwise, why would we do it? It serves a function, but could it perhaps be over applied in some instances? Thank you for your question. Yeah, I think we're, we have time for at least two or three more questions. So um, I'll pass the mic to you. Um, I wanted to ask like, how you would recommend we respond when we do make that invitation for others to be vulnerable or do the work that they need to do and heal their wounds and they choose to sort of avoid that pain and um, sort of decline that invitation. How do we accept what they're capable of bringing while also being able to take care of ourselves? Mm. That's such a great question. So we have limits, we have boundaries, whether or not you know what they are or not, you know? And I think a lot of us probably have had the friend where they're just like venting at length, right? They're sharing, but it's like now it's, it's gotten to a level where you're like, oh, I'm tired. Like, I'm exhausted from this. This is too much for me to carry. And I think that, I think it's okay in those instances to gently say, like, you know, I wonder if this is something where 
you need a dedicated space to process this, right? And, and maybe that's an invitation then to say like, maybe like, have you thought about seeing a therapist? Have you thought about, you know, somebody who could really in their training and their, you know, experience hold space for you in that way? Because I'm concerned that I may not be able to do this for you in this frequency, duration, length, you know? And I think that to be able to say that, I think it would have to be a relationship where there is some safety, you know, to set that boundary. But I do think that there are limits in how much we can carry for other people. And I think there's a difference between kind of, I'm sharing so that you are aware and that maybe there's a specific tangible thing I'm asking of that person, like to support me in a certain way. But if there isn't kind of a tangible support or just like I needed a space, a capsule space, but in fact it grows into something much larger, then perhaps we do need to set some boundaries and limits and think about how we support that person into getting kind of the help, the larger help that they might need. Um, but it is really tricky because you want to be helpful, you want to be empath empathetic, and at the same time, you might be in the midst of a lot of things yourself. And so there is that self and other tension that I think we struggle with a lot. Um, and so I would say, listen to your gut check, I always say. Like, can you gut check and say, could I do this again? And at this capacity or does this cross that line where it's just too much? Thank you. Hi, Dr. Wong. Thank you for your presentation. One thing that really stood out to me was when you mentioned how boundaries and setting them is how you show someone the way you want to be loved. But I think that sometimes in relation to family, there's a lot of set boundaries that kind of do the opposite and they don't want to show you or they don't want to love you the way that you want to be loved, whether that's making a boundary for yourself or setting it. Yeah. Um, and you also mentioned how mental health can be like social justice. And I feel like I know there's not one size fit all answer. And I admire the relationship building you've done with your family. So I wanted to ask you, how can we get our family to open up when they come from a different culture, they grew up in a different country, where opening up might not be the norm. Mm -hmm. And even though I will take this advice of just inhabiting the same space as a body with them, hopefully that will, you know, my presence will just help open that up. But I want to encourage them to open up to me. And I want to encourage my family to express their mental health concerns too, even though that's something that is not normal for them. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you had any advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I agree with you 100% that boundaries are very complex. And I think boundaries within families, within cultures, look really different from community to community. Um, and you ask the question, you know, what do you do if somebody chooses not to love you in the way that you've communicated or through the boundary that you've set? And I think that, you know, when we communicate a boundary, it's to say, this line exists. But when somebody crosses that boundary and does it repeatedly, right, and it's harmful to us, then we have to enforce that boundary now with a behavior. Perhaps, you know, I realize this is something that you want to talk to me about right now, but I cannot continue to have this conversation because it's too hurtful for me. So. I will call you again next week, or I will step away from this conversation. But in the end, I think boundaries can be communicated, but they also need to be enforced. And when we communicate a boundary over and over, and that person crosses it over and over, and we don't have a behavior to enforce it, then we're essentially telling them, it's okay. You cross it over and over and over, but there's no response, there's no consequence of crossing the boundary. And so I think it's hard, but when people can't love us a certain way, I think then we say, okay, then that way is no longer available to us. And I start to then look for ways where they can. 
And that's really hard. And I've seen this example even with my dad. Like, he's an acts of service guy, but he will say things that are extremely hurtful and have to be like, okay, I know your intentions are good, but you literally just like struck me in the gut. Like, it hurts bad. And I have to then disengage myself so that I can regulate myself and not react and worsen our dynamic. And so once I could accept that my dad can love me in these ways, but unfortunately not in the emotional, empathetic, relational ways, I think one, I had to grieve that. Like, and it was painful. It, it was a grief that I think took many years to, to move towards. But once I could accept what he could not be, then it freed up my energy to see what he could. And I say this all with the caveat that there are some people where they have family that they do not associate with, period. Mm -hmm. And that is an unfortunate reality for some people too, where the cost of staying connected is way too high and that person doesn't have insight or the desire to have insight to know how to love us well. And I think in those instances, people choose not to have contact. Um, and that's difficult. Um, to answer your second question about how do I, like the desire is so strong, and how do I create that more? Sometimes I have to remind myself that our parents have their own developmental journey. And I say this now because I've seen how like even my parents and my in-laws They've softened a lot now that we have our own kids. And they now are accessing these really interesting parts of themselves that I'm like never existed when I was a kid, right? And so like my dad is super playful with my kids, which I'm like, what? <laughs> like, where did that come from, right? And so sometimes we have to respect that they have their own pacing, that they have their own journey and Sometimes you have to accept that you may not get there with them, right? But if they love you, and I think we can sense perhaps they do in the midst of the painful, hurtful things they may do sometimes, then I can hold out hope, right? That one day maybe they'll surprise me. But I wish there was like a fix, but I think our patience and I think our enduring love for them keeps us in it. Thanks. Your answers helped me. <laughs> um, okay. Hello. Um, I have a quick question. So I feel like as Asian Americans or um, international Asians that are studying abroad in America, it's easy to feel like you're not American enough, but you're also not Asian enough, or you betrayed some part of your Asian identity by coming here to study abroad, things like that. Yeah. So when you are in this weird middle ground, how do you, I guess, approach concepts such as mental health without feeling like you're betraying your, I guess, cultural roots or like assimilating into an environment that you left home for? Mm, yeah, and that's so interesting, the tie of investing in mental health might actually be a betrayal of kind of those cultural roots I think I always hear about how, you know, sometimes people will say like, my parents are like, why would you air your dirty laundry out to a stranger? That's what therapy feels like, right? Um, and I think that, that that dichotomy between perhaps cultural values and mental health, that is one of the biggest gaps that exist, you know? And that perhaps when my mental health is better, I'm perhaps more equipped to honor my cultural values and roots, right? That I don't have to see that as a part of myself that I have to somehow disconnect or protect from. But it is hard because I think mental health is almost seen as like a Western thing. Like that's something that Western people do. And I hope that's changing in a lot of Asia, right? Like I feel like there are definitely psychologists and psychiatrists in Asia. But I think part of that is maybe it's a personal, private exploration that you start with first. Maybe you don't have to tell your parents that you're seeking mental health support or you're in therapy. Maybe you make that something that 
you develop within yourself first. And I trust that you, in your context, in your family, in your culture, you will start to see those connections between mental health and your cultural identity that only you can see, that you can draw connections and lines to, right? Because I can't see that, right? Because I don't know your culture as well as you do. And I always say that, like, if you watch any drama, any like Korean, Asian drama, and it's filled with tragedy. Those are all mental health themes, right? And yet they're like, no, we don't do mental health, right? So I've had people say like, they'll mention those themes when they, when they watch the dramas with their families and be like, oh yeah, that's trauma. Let's give a name for it. And maybe that's where you start, you know? But I think you're right. Sometimes we do have to think outside of the box because the typical language around mental health does feel very foreign for our families. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, so we're going to pass the mic now for closing remarks. Thank you for letting me share this stage with you for a second. Um, and appreciate everything you brought to the space today. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, hi everyone, I'm Shiraz. I am the Associate Director for the Asian American Cultural Center. And thank, oh, thank you, thank you. Um, Let's give another round of applause for our amazing PAM keynote speaker, Dr. Jenny Wang. I I know I had an amazing time and I hope you all really uh, had an amazing time connecting. Uh, There's just so many points that you hit on and like it really did resonate with me and I wanna really thank you for coming all the way here and uh, sharing with us. um, I also want to thank our uh, AACC staffer, Sunara, for her amazing moderating tonight. Thank you, Sunara. And also, I want to give a final shout out to our amazing leader, Dean Joliana Yi. If you don't know already, uh, Dean Yi will be going on maternity leave soon, so con- and congratulations on that as well. Uh, and we will, we will really, we will miss you. And thank you for all the amazing work you've done to help make this event happen, as well as many of our PAM events. And you'll see a lot of events that are upcoming. Dean Yi did do a lot of work behind the scenes, so really a special shout out for helping with that. So thank you. All right. So. I was asked to do some raffles, so I will do that right now. Um, we have some books that we will be raffling off. Uh, so if I, I have this list and I went and just typed in random number generator, so let's do that right now. Um, all right, here we go. Numbers one through 43 is how we had. So if your number is called, actually you don't have a number, you don't know what your number is. Okay, <laughs> pull out your tickets. Um, okay, here we go. Number. 18, and that is Ricky! Yay! (laughs) Congratulations. Next up, number 30, Cindy Min. Congratulations. Number 41, Annika Ergum! Annika! Number 25, Yolanda. Yolanda! Congratulations. I want to make sure I don't count too many numbers. Okay, just too many books, two books left. Okay. Number <laughs> six is Emily Crisculo. Congratulations. And last but not least, number. Four, Julia Zong. Congratulations. And I want to just close and say we have a ton of events still lined up for our PAM uh, events. Uh, when you come back from break, be sure to check them out. You might see some different uh, 
posters or even our calendar up here. Feel free to check that out, but also just check our website out as we update those in case anything changes. So the final time and date and things like that are on our website. So be sure to check that out. We have amazing events still lined up for you. Can't wait to have you attend those as well. But really, again, thank you all for being in space together. And I also want to give one final gift to our amazing speaker today from the AACC. Here you are. Wow. Yeah, of course. And thank you, everyone. Hope you have an amazing rest of the night, too. Thank you.
Yeah, that's what I was like, who would have thought? Yeah, who would have thought? Maybe. Yeah. 